and welcome to VIP Boxing's Bell to Bell podcast, episode 50. Yep, uh, half a century old when it comes to episodes. And uh, thanks to everyone who's downloaded, left a review. There's some great reviews on iTunes. And if you could download us on iTunes and leave a review, even better. Don't forget, we're also on Spotify and um, YouTube, of course. VIP Boxing's YouTube, which is a, a great outlet, great interviews on there. Um, anyway, I'm Steve Lillis, and will be my co-host John Evans, who's certainly not on the wrong side of fifty, unless unless he's got that them them impish looks. Uh, you okay, John? And you're not fifty, are you? I'm closing in on it. Closing in on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Yeah, fifty eight. It's been a we've just it's a slow burner at start, wasn't it? But we've we've ground on, haven't we? People seem to finally be taking notice of this. Yeah, it's good. It's, it's going well. I'm happy. I enjoy doing it. And, you know, we, we chat good boxing. But for, for a landmark episode, John, there's only one man to get on. It's the head of the firm, Mr. VIP Steve Wood. He might wear his, his readers above his, above his head there, but he, he's turning up in a suit for the 50th. Now, I think he's had a meeting or something today while he's in a whistle. So, Steve, thanks for wearing the suit just for us today. You OK, pal? Yeah, well, listen, I'm pushing 60, aren't I? I'm 60 next year. And uh, congratulations to Steve and John on this 50th one. You, Like you say, you've, you've all gone in there and you, you're turning out some quality. And uh, it was nice to see that you got recognised in the, the rankings of the week, wasn't it, up in the, in the top 10. So, so well done, boys. And uh, I'm looking forward to this one. I know there's uh, some subjects I'm not sure where you're going with on them, but uh, I'm looking forward to a, a little contribution to it all. Well, one thing, you, your remarks about Ebony Bridges, plenty of people picked up on over the... I, think, I, don't, know, I don't know what went down the, the most... John's rant last week, or you on Ebony Bridges in the last 50 episodes, they're on the short list for the, uh, the moments of the pod so far. Right, well, I'm going to behave myself on today's special <laughs> one, the 50th, innit? Have you got that? You got your clock ready there, John? Everything's ready to go. We're going to start with you, Steve. You've seen the running order. I think you want to talk about um, Shackle Stevenson. Is he going to be the daddy? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I'm not one for really watching the uh, the international and the American fighters. Although, obviously, when the big fights, I do tune in. But because of the fact that we're talking about Josh Waddington fighting him probably two and a half years ago now, uh, I had a good look at him at the time. And that, our take on the when we looked there was that that kid's only going to get better if we're going to fight him we might as well fight him now before he gets better um, for whatever reasons it, it didn't happen but I've watched his development Saturday night he's beat Jamel Henning who's I'm not saying he's a great world champion but he was a good steady world champion uh, beat Carl Frampton in, in, in his uh, last fight quite well and um, he's now a two-weight world champion He's had the COVID over 18 months. He's only been a pro for four and a half years. It's a fantastic achievement. Look at who he's fought. I mean, his records are the last people he's fought 23 and 2, 21 and 1, 28 and 2, 13 and 1, 23 and 0. That was when he won the, um, the Featherweight World Championship. He's not been matched easy at all. I think if he stays at Super Featherweight, probably beats uh, Valdez to become the, the unified champion. Um, I, I think he could even move up to lightweight and get in the mix with all the, the, the people that um, John was uh, getting upset about last week. He wouldn't be scared of having a fight, that's for sure. The Shaka Stevenson, I think he could be the one, and that's what I want to say to you, lads. Do you agree, or, or am I miles off the mark? Go on, John, you, you're good on these lightweights. You're going to go yeah, here. I'm not, I'm not mentioning lightweights. He's a, he's a super <laughs> feather. Yeah, he, he was great, wasn't he? The thing, that, the thing that stuck out at me most was he... He looked solid, didn't he? He looked like mm. he'd really grown into the weight. He looked thick. He looked he looked powerful. Herring couldn't do anything with him. Stevenson took the yes. centre of the ring and just bullied him, didn't he? He was boxing mm. him, but he was also hurting him and, and bullying him about. And I, I think being solid is all that Shakur needed, and not just in the ring, outside the ring. I've been in hotels with him where he's been joking around and wrestling Terence Crawford like a little school kid running round. But now mm. it just seems like he's grown up. He's taking his training serious. And he looked the complete package, didn't he? He didn't look like he had a weakness. Yeah, look, you know what? I, I, haven't, I haven't read the fight. I haven't seen the fight. I've just read some, you know, people who I trust and uh, uh, raved about him. But you know what? There's a lot, there's a clamour for him to go and fight these lightweights who John 
knows won't fight each other. But you know what? I'd like to see him spend another 18 months at this weight. There's so many good fights for him at this weight. Obviously, their natural fight is the unification Steve mentioned with Oscar Valdez. Even Miguel Burchow, who... who, who um, who Valdez beat. But you know what? There's things like Chris Colbert, um, who he'd beat. But that would be a big fight on the East Coast, New York versus Newark. There's so much about him out there, but depth for him out there. But down the line, the obvious fight's got to be against um, Javonta Davis, I guess. Yeah, yeah that, that's if I had to pick a fight to, to, to watch now, it would be MB Tank and, uh, you know, genuine pay-per-view on that. Round two, um, is it all white? Dylan White pull out. I just wanted to really just gauge opinion on it. Um, I don't think it's... Look, you've got to understand why he's done this. You know, if, he, if it is an injury, let's hope he gets recovered quickly. But even if it isn't and he'd pulled out without any real excuse, you've got to understand it because that Fury fight is almost certainly going to be made, even if it's not mandated by the WBC. I think that's, that's the road Fury is going to take. It's a nat natural fight for him to take while Usyk and Joshua sort, sorts of thing out. It's just that, you know, the problem with this this thing, you know, pulling out is people have bought tickets, booked hotel rooms, um, you know, and, and and that's a bitter pill for those to swallow. But I totally understand why why he's not taking this against Otto Wallin. What I, what I do hope is that Otto Wallin gets compensated some way, even if it's with a really good fight. I don't want to see Otto Wallin just suddenly appear here in, in December as a consolation against, you know, just some ordinary British heavyweight. Mm. Well, listen, boxing is, is pulling out to take the risk. Like you said, he understands it. And I'd like to think that he would come out with the truth and say that. So I, 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 I believe he has, he has got in. But it all depends what's in the contract. I mean, if if he has changed his mind, he doesn't want to have this fight as a marking time fight waiting for the big fight. Um, something in the contract says if he says that, it could cost him a lot of money in compensation. So you never know what, what's in the contract. But I, I think he'd be, he'd be a genuine injury. Um, from what I can see, the uh, the punters have been allowed a period of time to uh, get the tickets back if they don't want to go to the show. And also, um, I believe he's been offered a couple of fights on there, including fighting Babbitts for reasonable money. So uh, I think uh, they've done as fair as they can. And um, as I promote myself, I know how hard it is when things do go wrong. So uh, I don't think Eddie would have wanted to run uh, with a big top of the bill like that and then, then, then pull it off. So uh, it's just one of those things that happens. And, and this sport is happening quite a lot now. Yeah, it, well, it said uh, cancelled and not postponed, didn't it? Yeah. So, Normally they say, oh, you know, the fight's been postponed and we'll reschedule, but they've just said it's cancelled. And I'm sure I saw a White interview where he said he, he definitely wants Fury next. I'll tell you, it shows what cloth Fury's cut from, doesn't it? Because Wallin was one of his keep busy fights before he fought Wilder the second time. Yeah. Mm. You know, yeah. In, in between. But you can't, White's, uh, it's, just, it's convoluted, isn't it? But he, he has been on, waited a long time for a shot, yeah. hasn't he? So... No, you're right. I can't blame yeah. him. No issue with it. This is his chance of maybe getting a six, seven, you know, could be, who knows what it's going to end up with, pay and now. Over to you, John. It's about matching at the right time. Yeah, I was thinking about um, the Brad Ray fight yesterday. and It was a hell of a fight, wasn't it? Um, I'm not sure how much say Steve had in this because it was, seemed like it was pretty much made on Twitter. But we all knew that Brad was ready for a step up. And although he, he had to work hard and it was a, a tremendous fight, he was always felt that step ahead. You know, he always had a little bit more than Jess Smith. But I, I was thinking about there's no set pattern. Is there? There's no science to picking the right time to step a fighter up. You know, for some of them, do you hold them back until you've seen certain boxes tick, Steve? And, and then you, no matter how long that takes, you hold them back until you've seen it. Is for some fighters you gamble with because you see an opponent you think they can on the best day they might be able to beat. Is, is there some fighters who aren't doing it, putting it in in the gym, so you just throw them in, sink or swim? Is there an art? Is there anything you look for when you pick the right time for a match, uh, a step up for these lads? Well, I think when you say there's an art, there is an art, but it's like a black art because there's no perfect way of doing it. If you take that, the last fight of Brad's. You know, we did, knew we needed to step up and we knew Jess Smith was always going to be a step up and competitive. But if you look back, 
in the first minute when he's dropped him in that body shot, or sorry, the first round, he's dropped him in that body shot, and the, the kid's done really well to get up. Now, if that would have happened, you'd have just said, right, we've got to push him on even more. But he wouldn't have learned anything because he only had bloody two and a half minutes in, in, the, in the ring. So the fact that he went on and had eight hard rounds well, if A, he develops him more, but he's kind of shown us that he does need a couple more fights like that before he steps up. But if he'd have dropped him and finished him in that first round, we could have rushed him a little bit more than, than we needed to. So um, it, it's little things like that that can change the path of um, careers. And, you know, I've been doing this 25 years now, and when you see these subjects, it always reminds me that with Jamie Moore, we left him at British title too long, you know, I mean, he's defended the, the British title seven times, never ended up getting a world title fight. Maybe that would have happened if we'd let him fight for the European, which we didn't do because the kids who were there at the time were world-class fighters. We thought, we'll save them for the world title, but he never got a world title. So there is a balance of sometimes you hold them back and sometimes you, 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 you've got to push them on and really and truthfully... Um, that the black art can, can, can be changed with, with, with circumstances outside of your control. But, um, you know, um, there's a lot of people who, who, who get it wrong. We like to think here at VIP, we, we, we get more right than wrong. Yeah, Brad Ray's matchmaking. It... Fair hey, enough. We, we need to hear from Woody there. Um, mm. Round five, just something I saw. I was, going, I was going down the Twitter timeline last night and I saw a Twitter debate about main event starting late. I know Sky have changed it a little bit for their last show. Whether that's going to stay or what, I don't know. And I thought it was worth a chat. I don't think no sport anywhere has treated its fans so badly with the timing of main events for TV over the years than boxing. You know, you're missing last buses, last trains, last tubes. You know, and it's different for us journos, John, because we've got to work there and cover press conferences. So it is what it is. But for punters, I, I think no sports treat them so badly. And I'm wondering, should we be seeing these main events a lot earlier on cards on TV? Um, for example, I know I've, I've heard some, you know, figures for TV channels. When they start, you know, if it's a social boxing show, they'll... If a football match, Man United have played Everton or something and it's finished at 7.15 and gone straight into boxing, the boxing would have great figures for first half for the first half an hour or so and it would gradually drop off because there's no names in. You know, would it benefit from boxing, all main events on TV starting at 8 or 9 at the very latest? I know some you can't do when there's live American TV for a network that matters because of the money they're being thrown in. But I just think, you know, that there's some, we look, we look at ways where boxing can improve. And there's one, I know it's not topical, but I just saw this debate on Twitter last night and I thought it was worth raising. Mm. Well, I, I think from a, t a TV point of view, obviously uh, they've got the demographics and, and they know what, what's right. So um, they probably would want the main events at, at nine, but they want to keep them till later on to keep everybody, not just in the crowds there, but watching on TV. But Nat Basso used to say to me, there's no bad time for a, a good show and there's no good time for, the, for a bad show. So uh, I think taking the casuals away from it, the boxing people are going to watch it whatever time they're on. The only, the only problem is that the volumes nowadays is the casual people. So they're trying to hook on the... Uh, the football followers onto it. Maybe it is time that you put your um, main card on at nine o'clock on TV, and then you keep your ticket selling undercards for, for afterwards. I, I sometimes think it's the order of the shows. Maybe if you put on the the, the most lightly crowd pleaser as the first fight on the show to yeah. to hook people in. But I'm sure it'd help with advertising these TV shows and stuff if you could say Joshua Rusick first bell ten o'clock. You know, just that, you can have the rest of the show going around it. 10 o'clock's a good time, but if you could actually nail that time down, if a fight finishes early, people have got to wait. If, if everything finishes early, you can put a float on, but I think maybe scheduling the, the main event for a good, reasonable time, I think that's a good way forward. Yeah. All right. I went there in the wrong order there, so you should have been you there, Steve. So we'll go to your second subject. Yeah, Steve, something yeah. that's close to your heart, I know. Yeah, well, obviously, I keep saying I'm the king of small all boxing, and um, 
I like to believe, believe we are. We've had a few workups in September where we didn't get shows over the line. But I'm getting a bit confused now whether uh, small or boxing is actually booming or dying. And, and uh, only time will tell. And I think now's not the real time to, to, to judge it. It'll be next year when everything kind of settles down. But at the moment, it seems to be booming because everybody's selling tickets. You know, lads who might sell 60 tickets are selling 100 tickets. And that's because everyone's desperate to get out and do it. But, you know, we're struggling to, to, to make fights. And the people who's taking advantage of it are the, uh, the, the managers of, of away fighters, you know, because they're in, in such short demand and they, they're demanding that their kids don't get stopped. And, you know, uh, all that's making for is, is poor shows. And we don't want to do that. We're bringing more foreigners in. You know, I had a, a show on Thursday night just with four fights and we had to, like, bring three three foreigners in and uh, the only the fourth one we got from someone because the show had pulled you know I think three more shows got pulled this this weekend because uh, they couldn't match up which is as I say bad for small all because people are buying tickets getting ready to go out and then the night before they find out it's not happening so I think that's having a, a bad effect in it and the poor quality of the fights isn't going to help I mean I heard a story the other week, I can't mention names, but there was one kid leaning out of the ropes saying to his, his cornerman that I'm being hit too hard. You know, it's like, is is it going to be really that detrimental to, to small or bo boxing as we go forward? As I say, we're trying to make sure it doesn't happen, but uh, I'm seeing it all over the place and uh, hopefully all these people who are selling more tickets want to come back. But if they see, keep seeing the dross that's about at the moment... Um, it ain't going to be that long. You know what? It's a double-edged sword, Steve, because the boxing's booming for the number of shows, and that's great for boxers because they're getting paid. But we're having to depend too much on imports to save shows. Like Pat Barrett had a show in Liverpool the other night. John and myself um, were working at, and you know, and you know that that got from ten to six fights, and they were depending on a couple of imports. You know, um, mm. one of them had been here thirty times and got beat. You know, just to save the show, and I know. Curtis Gargano was at a show in South Sea on Saturday, and his man was the only British B side fight that the rest were five guys LCS to found at the last minute. Um, mm. You know, and also promoters are still losing too much money, so I don't think that's good. Yeah, I, maybe it'd be better if it's less shows because uh, from what I see at the moment, a lot of the journeymen are just desperately trying to survive, and if there was less shows, more spaced out. You might get some better fights. Um, everything's, I, I don't know, there's so much money for the journeymen at the moment, isn't there? They're just desperate to not get stopped and it, it's making mm. for some, some pretty one-sided spectacles, really. Topic you talked about all night. Round six, um, quite a, be a bit of a fun one. John, go on. Yeah, I got reminded of this on Twitter. Someone we know, like Chris Walker, trolled through my past out of the God blue almighty, and yeah. the I made. And it, I remember it. Um, it was when Javante Davis came over to fight Liam Walsh. Now, we, we were around Box Nation at the time, Steve, and there was a lot of people yeah, down yeah, at hey. ranks who really fancied Liam. And I got bit by that. And I didn't pick him out right, but I turned up at the Copper Box that night thinking, Liam can do this. You know, Davis was doing the weight badly at the time. He was a young kid. It was his first time abroad. Liam can fight. And I, I thought Liam could do it. And I, I was thinking earlier about some other ones I picked and the other one, I, I was 100% certain Andrew Galotta was going to knock out Tyson. <laughs> yeah, there was yeah. nothing I was more sure about than that. I, I thought Galotta had more left he was going to do Tyson and he quit after three minutes, didn't he? But uh, <laughs> yeah, have you picked any uh, absolute stinkers? You know what? I was close to a lot of filming with Liam Walsh up in Chrome with his brothers. They're a lovely family and Ryan particularly has been a brilliant guest on this podcast and we'll have to get him back maybe in the next few weeks. Yeah. Um, I gave him a big chance that night. I'd been around him, you know. Yeah, I, I was. I, I don't. I'm not sure. I went on Twitter and said, but you know what? <laughs> Fury, in more recent time, Fury Wilder too. Um, I was big on Jazza Dickens both times against Galahad, a fight that never happened. And I was now on if it did happen was David Price to beat Tyson Fury. You know, <laughs> I was, you know, it never happened. And I never get one when you brought this up, come straight to me. And I'm not really a gambler, as you know, John, but I had a 
big bet years and years ago. So did um, my great mate, the late Dean Powell. I, I pointed this out and we steamed him. And I think it was in Cardiff. Her face was dropping lower and lower by the second. It was Joe Kawasaki to stop Rick Formbury in a common in a super middleweight title fight. Who Rick had come over and fought Henry Walton about three years earlier and was terrible. He got smashed in five rounds. He had about eight wins after that. And about six of them had terrible losing records. And I'll take that as a big L because Kawasaki beat him on points. So yeah. that, that was the one that hurt me most because yeah. my, my, my wallet wasn't very well on that Sunday morning. I don't drink, but my wallet had the worst hangover of all time. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I, I can think of a, of a couple. One going back a while was I remember being in the pub and someone saying like... Uh, Lloyd Unigan is, is going to beat uh, Donald Curry. <laughs> and I've got no chance. And he was seven to one. So I said, I'll take the seven to one. Save you got to the bookies. He's got no <laughs> chance. So uh, that was a that was a bad one for me. But but only recently, um, Mickey Garcia getting beat the other night by that yeah. uh, Sandor Martin. You know, um, yeah, you've been big on Garcia. Garcia's one of my favourite fighters. Yeah. And... Uh, I just, just couldn't believe that. And a few people had said to me, he's got any chance? I've got no chance, no chance. And when I woke up next morning, I didn't stay up and watch the fight. Uh, i seen the result of that and I found that hard to believe. You know, uh, Mickey Garcia, to, to me, was a pound for pound. Yeah. But it's crazy. Sometimes you just get, you can't, you get so fixated on an outcome, you just can't be talked out of it, can you? No matter what yeah, anyone and says. You do, and mm. you know what? And but, but, as, as, as journalists, John, out covering, we do get impressed by what a fighter tells us, how he, how he, how he, um, you know, goes and all that. And I'm sure you know, perhaps just, I mean, Steve Bunce is when there's a fight where it could go either way. He always waits until the weigh-in to decide yeah. which way he's going to go, and then he'll make a pick. But you know, we do, we do we're not sold a dummy by these guys. They come, we'll sit down with a guy, and we'll see this guy actually using confidence. And you, and you go with it because you've been around these people. It's very easy to to get them wrong. And yeah, we got plenty wrong, but I want my, I certainly haven't got the time to go around Chris Walker's time feed and go um oh, and look no. at look and look at what like, what he's got wrong. Where do these people fight? You know, Chris <laughs> is a mate of mine. And he's a great mate of yours, and so I know Steve is a pal of his. And I know they're always rowing over football on Twitter. But where do these people? You know, <laughs> where do you find the time to scroll down John Evans' timeline? I I couldn't. Even tell you, John, what you tweeted in the last week. I've seen the old thing on there. A couple of them something funny last week, but I couldn't scroll down anyone's time. It's like these people who go mad when they're blocked by someone on Twitter and muted. I couldn't see who's blocked me on Twitter. I haven't got a clue. Yeah, well, one thing for sure, you'd waste your time checking on Chris Walkers because he's never lost a bet, has he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, fellas, um, hey, thanks very much for tonight. But, Steve, tell us what VIP boxing shows we got coming up in the near future. I know you've got a cracker right. in Leeds coming up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just uh, had Josh Argreaves here a, a minute ago just signed his, his contract. So uh, it's his yeah. debut in Leeds on the 13th. And uh, we've got a lot of, lot of young talent um, on that. He's probably the best show I've, I've put together for, for about five years with uh, proper talent on, on, on the show. You know, like Reese Moles topping the bill. You've got Bob Jassy on it there. Mally Wright's mate, having his, his second fight. Say, Corey Regan, Josh Argreaves, just added Ben Marks be on to it today. Um, we, we, we've got a, a few others as well making a debut in the... I'm really excited about that show because, you know, we've probably got eight kids on there who could all possibly go on and be, be champions. So, uh, you know, uh, it's going to it's gonna be a real, real good night. Jake Goodwin's making his, his debut. Um, we, we've got November the 5th in, in Liverpool and then... All the way to Christmas now, we've got a show every week. So we're back in Liverpool on the 19th, 26th, and we're back in Bolton on the 27th. Um, just waiting. Some news we can give here. It looks like Jack Flatley's got a European title fight. So uh, he'll be off that bill and we'll, we'll put someone else to, to top it. But uh, we've got a little domestic, uh, two, two kids find each other from the same area, which is always called Andrew Fleming and... Uh, I forget the other kid's name now. Oh, um, I know, the kid who was with Pat Barrett. Yeah. Um, Dan something he's called, isn't he? Yeah, Dan, Dan yeah. I know yeah, the guy, yeah. yeah. So that, that'll be a great fight. And then we go Pat. on to December, we've got the 4th in Manchester, then we've, we've got the Jolly Boys, the 12th in Liverpool, and the 19th in uh, Manchester. So, um, 
it's going to be like the mad September we had. You know, we had a fairly quiet October. We've just done two shows. Um, but it's like five shows in um, November, three shows December, and then uh, obviously we've got a few kids on the, the TV shows, you know, Jack Cullen and Zelf and Barrett are in big fights on the uh, 18th. They're going to be announced. It looks like Brad Ray's going to be on the 11th in Birmingham. So, uh, yeah, I'm really uh, looking forward to a busy end of the year. And then we're just going to have January and February off and come back in, uh, in March with quite a few shows. Yes, good. I'm, I tell you, I'm looking forward to Josh Hargreaves. I've never seen him, but a few people have told me he's really exciting. And I was talking, I think it was John I was talking to the other night, and he won the um, the under-20 fight and under-10 fight, a, the ABA titles, the development titles, and they're hard, hard titles to win. And, you know, mm. guys that win them, not saying they're world beaters, but they generally, from the ones that turn pro, generally tend to adapt really well. Yeah, I was surprised that he's 27 when he, it's the first yeah. time I've met him tonight and uh, he was saying like he'd hurt his uh, elbow when he was a, a junior and he had six years out of boxing, but, uh, you know, he's feeling really fresh and looking forward to, to doing something, yeah. Yeah, I don't know how you're doing all these shows, Steve. I think you're after what mm. happened, you know, September, all the aggro, you're, I think you're asking for more. I think that's what you must be into, Gavin, aggro. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to add, John? No, no, it's good one that flown by tonight. Yeah, it is, yeah, blimey. It's half half, half, well, half eight where I am, half seven where you are. Um, mm-hmm. Cheers, fellas, anyway. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening to episode 50. Thanks for coming on, Woody. Thanks very much, John. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Cheers, fellas. For all boxing, info, news, and latest interviews, amateur and pro, across and off, click and subscribe. VIP, boxing promotions. Also, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook.